In this first module, we will review a brief history of the evolution of lumbar spine exercise to help you respect where our profession has come from, how it's evolved, and hopefully encourage you to be part of the solution for finding best practices and evidence. We will start by discussing some theory and practice changing research from the 1990s to today. In the early 1990s, Panjabi hypothesized that the spinal stabilizing system is composed of three subsystems. These include active, passive, and neural. The active subsystem consists of muscles that surround and support the spinal column. The passive subsystem consists of non-contractile tissue such as the intervertebral disc and li ligaments. And the neural subsystem consists of the central nervous system. A dysfunction to one of those subsystems may require compensatory or adaptive mechanisms to improve movement performance and reduce tissue injury. Here are some more specifics on the subsystems and what they mean to us as rehab clinicians. The active system gives our brain and body feedback on forces and motion that the spine is experiencing. It also is an actuator of stiffness, meaning it controls the amount of muscle contraction or motion that is occurring. Impairments in this system are noted by decreasing muscle size, decrease in endurance, and decrease in strength. The passive system tells the brain about the position and motion of the lumbar segments. Damage to this system will create hypermobility. Notice that I said hypermobility and not instability. Instability only occurs when hypermobility becomes symptomatic. For some individuals, our active and neural systems can compensate for impairments in this passive system. And finally, the neural system processes all the information from active and passive and decides what needs to happen. This is where our motor control deficits are seen, including poor activation, poor timing, poor proprioception, etc. Simply pain with or without tissue damage can cause impairments in this system and thus impairments in motor control. Next, Bergmark further broke down the active subsystem into local and global muscle systems. The local muscles consist of the transverse abdominis, multifidus, diaphragm, and pelvic floor. These are made up of mostly type 1 fibers, thus they are fatigue resistant. When all is good, they are continuously on at a low level, tonic contraction, and their activation is independent of direction of movement, and they are anticipatory, meaning that they fire before other movements or other muscle contractions occur. They help control a neutral joint position and control joint motion between segments. In pain states, they tend to underfire. The global muscles are the obliques, rectus abdominis, gluteals, latissimus dorsi, quadratus lumborum, and paraspinals. They are made up of mostly type 2 fibers. Their contractions are phasic and their action is dependent on the direction of force. In pain states, they tend to overfire. We then started to study those local muscles in those with back pain in the late 90s and early 2000s. What was found was that in pain states, local muscles saw structural and functional changes. Structurally, we saw a reduced cross-sectional area of the lumbar multifidus along with fatty infiltration. We also saw activations of the transverse abdominis and lumbar multifidus that were delayed and more phasic versus constant. They were also quick to fatigue. The conclusion of this was that pain and injury created poor local muscle performance, which decreased the stiffness of our spine and then increased the susceptibility to deformation, shear forces, thus more pain. This was exciting stuff. Pain caused poor muscle performance. What better people than us than to improve performance of these muscles? So we started to look into what effect addressing these muscles would have on pain and function and what we found was unfortunately shocking. First of all, these impairments may be more of an effect versus a cause of low back pain, meaning isolating treatment of these muscles may not improve pain. Also, size doesn't matter. The size of the lumbar multifidus does not predict those who would benefit from stabilization exercise, and improvements in pain are not associated with changes in lumbar multifidus thickness. And finally, Performance of these muscles are not predictive of who will do well with stability exercise. There are weak associations between baseline characteristics and future outcomes. 
In fact, changes in activation tend not to be associated with corresponding changes in clinical outcomes. That is rather disappointing. So then, Dr. Stuart McGill and others came along to see what else we needed to do regarding spinal exercise. McGill specifically began looking into the importance of the guy wire actions of the previously overlooked global muscles. He found that all muscles stabilize and that we need a balance of systems. He found that delays and impairments occur in most muscles, that the activation of the transverse abdominis in isolation is actually impossible, and it may, in fact, delay the patient's progress. He also rocked the boat with finding that bracing may be superior to the abdominal draw-in maneuver, which was being used in rehabilitation and research. He stated that no one muscle contributes more than 30% to spinal stability. This means we need a variety of exercises targeting a variety of musculature. That brings us to the most recent systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We mostly agree that an unbalanced spine will subject patients to compression and shear forces and that we need to find or restore balance and adequate motor control. We know exercise is good and better than a wait and see approach, but what exercise is best is still up for debate. No approach has been shown to be superior and motor control exercises typically do not win out over general exercise. Is this due to lack of homogeneity? Possibly. However, a review in 2014 noted very strong evidence that motor control exercise is not superior to general exercise and that further research is unlikely to alter the conclusion. In fact, over the past 20 years, stabilization exercises have not been shown to result in clin clinically meaningful improvements. So that brings us to the start of 2019 with continued challenges and questions. First of all, there is no consistency in terminology. Lumbar stabilization exercise and motor control exercise are used interchangeably in research. Even within these groups of exercise, some consider stabilization as just activation, and some include extremity movements, and some use biofeedback in forms of pressure units and ultrasound. There is unfortunately little consistency. Another concern is that the protocols are poor. Most do not progress into functional tasks. Most spend too much time statically and neglect the dynamic control the spine requires. They are also not individualized, which is difficult to do in research. I believe this is why we have not seen clinical improvements in 20 years of research. And finally, improving pain and function of the spine is more than just our prior model of thinking of core stability. So who needs exercise? If we give the right exercise to the right people at the right time, we may see better outcomes. We have the clinical practice guidelines written recently in 2018, and in my opinion, a fantastic editorial written in 2018 to guide us. According to our clinical practice guidelines, patients under the categories of mobility deficit, movement coordination impairment, related or referred lower extremity pain, and radiating pain would benefit from exercise. Those that fall under the movement control impairment will have exercise as their primary intervention, whereas the others may have exercise as secondary or tertiary. Those patients that fall under the movement control category may report recurring low back pain, have a presence of aberrant movements, pain during initiation or mid-range movements, and or have pain with provocation of involved lumbar segments. Per the 2017 update to the treatment-based classification system, after a patient's acute symptoms are minimized to allow for moderate disability, stable symptoms, and moderate to low pain, the patient should transition into movement control. Here, treatments include sensory motor exercise, such as dissociation and articulation, stabilization exercises, and flexibility exercise. Once patients have proven competency with good motor control, they then progress to functional optimization where the goal is strength and endurance. Please note that to progress to functional optimization, disability must be low and symptoms controlled. 
Also note that some patients may not need to progress to functional optimization. They may demonstrate good motor control after acute symptoms resolve or with very minimal coaching. The prior slide was speaking to more general lumbar exercise. In this slide, we are identifying those who need specific stabilization strategies. These patients may need to spend more time with activation exercises and follow the lumbar stabilization protocol as reported in the Robin 2014 article in your references. We will be reviewing these exercises in lab. However, you can also refer to Foundations of Intervention Lab number 6, titled Stabilization, for other ideas. You may base your decision on who needs specific stabilization on what the patients report subjectively. A high suspicion that a patient needs specific stabilization should arise if they report their back giving out, frequently popping their back, a history of trauma or pain that worsens over time, pain with transitional movements, or pain with quick movements. This information can be collected through the self-report instability questionnaire. You may also base your decision on what you see objectively. Those who have aberrant motion and a positive prone instability test have an 80% chance of improvement with a specific stabilization exercise protocol. You may also assess activation of the transverse and multifidus as we did in examination and evaluation. If the patient fails that test, that then becomes their treatment. As you have found and will continue to realize, there is no simple recipe for exercise selection. There are many things that need to be considered when selecting an exercise. This includes, but is not limited to, what evidence is supporting for our particular patient presentation and demographic, your and the patient's prior experience. If they have had success with exercise in the past, work on creating a similar exercise plan. If they have trialed exercise unsuccessfully, question the types that they were trying and select different types or styles of exercise. Their activity level. What is their current foundation of fitness? What activities do they enjoy doing? Their goals. What activities do they prioritize returning to? Your objective assessment. Please see the class handouts as well as the YouTube videos created for this class. You may also review materials from prior semesters, including exam eval, for ideas of relevant objective tests. You must also consider symptom irritability. Please realize that this may change session to session, so respect that your treatment plan is not always a linear progression. Thank you for reviewing this module prior to class. I hope you will find it helpful as we learn and practice specific exercises in lab.